Zechariah chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Hear the words of the Lord. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me, like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on, to, on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know these, what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Zerubbabel. You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which reign through the, reign through the whole earth. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right and to the left of the lampstand? And the second time I answered and said to him, what are these two branches of the olive trees which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out. He said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. These are God's words. You may be seated. We thank God for another blessed morning to be gathered here in the household of faith. The word of the Lord says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So this is a place of rejoicing, a place that we should love and long to be, amen. Week after week, whenever the doors of the church are open, our hearts should long to be there. I know Crawford shared on last week that we're taking kind of a a 30,000 foot view, if you will, from uh, Zechariah taking text chunks at a time. But uh, for this particular one, I thought we'd just stick with chapter four. Uh, I think its message, as is, is Rachel prayed, is timely for us. Uh, certainly was timely for me. And so we're just going to look at chapter four on this morning, if that's all right with y'all. Amen? amen? Amen, amen. From the moment God made man, he has had work. For man to do. We see this from the very beginning. In Genesis 1 and 26, we find these words. Then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock. And over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Continuing in chapter 2, verse 15, the word of the Lord says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Where there is man, God has work. Where there are people, God has purpose. There is nobody that is not somebody, and everybody is tasked with some manner of work. But God doesn't just give assignment without assessment. That is to say, whatever assignment is given, God has already assessed and supplied the necessary gifting needed to carry out the assignment. In between God making the man in Genesis 1 and 26 and putting man in the garden to work it and to keep it in Genesis 2 and 15, we find these words in Genesis 2 and 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. Man was created. Man was gifted the breath of life. Man was assigned to work. 
We can look throughout Scripture and we'll find this play out over and over again. It is God's SOP, his standard operating procedure. It's a given. Whenever you see man, you will see work for man to do. And where there is work for man to do, you will see God given capacity for man to fulfill the appointed task. Now, it's important to note that not all men have the same capacity. That should make sense to us because all men aren't created to do the same work. And while this should make sense to us, and on the surface it might, you understand, you know not everybody has the same work. Even in here, not everybody carries the same work. But how often do you compare your gifting or your ability to that of the next person? How often do we look at our gifting or ability or look at our capacity and feel unqualified or inadequate to do a task because we're looking at the next person and their ability, their gifting? Have you ever shied away from a task because you felt that the next person could do it better? Or worse still, have you ever refused to participate or to put your hands to a task because you felt you had nothing to offer. It is God who assigns and assesses, so whatever measure you possess, know that it is more than enough to fulfill God's purpose in you and for you. And please know and understand that everyone possesses a measure. All have ability, all have gifting. Remember, it is God's standard operating procedure. If you have breath, you have work. And if you have work, you have the ability, the gifting, the capacity required to complete the work. In our text this morning, we see a man named Zerubbabel. 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 <laughs> Pick. Amen. I've said Zerubbabel all my life. And it's probably me. I'm sorry, brother. <laughs> Amen, amen. But God is speaking to the prophet Zechariah about this man by way of a vision. And through this vision, God is speaking to the man about his mandate and the measure required to fulfill it. If we were in a missionary Baptist church, one might say God is telling him where there is vision, there is provision. There's work that falls to Zerubbabel. Through this vision, and God is giving assurance about the work, encouraging him, if you will, that God has already assessed the assignment and that he has already supplied all things required for the assignment to be completed. As we walk through our text this morning, we'll examine three things, the vision, the interpretation, and the proclamation. The vision, the interpretation, and the proclamation. Again, we look to the vision, and the angel who talked with me came and woke me like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see, and behold, a lampstand, all of gold with a bowl on the top of it, and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one to the right of the bowl and the other to its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? This is the fifth of eight dreamlike visions of Zechariah the prophet. It's a vision that carries profound insights about the work of the people and the work of the spirit. Israel has returned home, uh, uh, but they've returned home to uh, uh, a home in ruins, a place in ruins. Some 70 years have passed and nothing is as they remembered it to be. And if returning to widespread de uh, destruction or devastation wasn't enough, the work that they started was put on hold due, polit due to political posturing by people who didn't want to see Israel prospering again. So after dealing with 70 years of exile, they are now dealing with approximately a 17-year delay in the efforts to rebuild the temple, the very work that they came back home to do. God's people here in Zechariah, possibly like some of us or many of us, were in need of encouragement to put their hands to the work that was in front of them. 
not only in need of encouragement to work, but in need of assurance that they were not working alone, that God was indeed with them. Looking to the vision, we see the prophet being stirred by the angel as one awakened from sleep. In this vision, we see three things. We see a solid gold lamp stand, a bowl on top of it, seven lamps or four things, seven lamps on it and two olive trees next to it. The golden lamp stand with seven lamps or seven lights is a version of the tabernacle lamp stand. As described in Exodus 25, the word of the Lord says, you shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made hammered, uh, of hammered work. Its base, its stems, its cups, its calyxes, and its flowers shall be of one piece with it. And there shall be six branches going out of it, three branches on the lampstand out of one side, and three branches on the lampstand out of the other side. Verse 37 says, you shall make seven lamps for it, and the lamp shall be set up so as to give light on the space in front of it. The connection between the lampstand lights and olive trees is explained for us in Exodus 27 and 20, which commands the Israelites to bring clear oil of pressed olives for the light so that the lamps may be kept burning. And while the lampstand in this vision is very similar to the tabernacle lampstand, there are noticeable points of difference. The seven lamps have seven lips, according to the ESV, or seven spouts, according to the CSV. Lampstands, or excuse me, and the lampstand has a bowl on top of it. Now, the word here, and forgive me that I didn't make note of these words, but the word for lip and the word for bowl are used nowhere else in Scripture in relation to the lampstand. Nor the bowl mentioned in the explanation of the vision in latter verses, but one can reasonably infer that the bowl functions as a reservoir for the oil for the seven lamps. This is another notable, noticeable difference, notable difference from the temp tabernacle lampstand, which required constant intervention from the priest. Leviticus 24 gives us a glimpse of this. He says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, command the people of Israel to bring you pure oil from beaten olives for the lamp that a light may be kept burning regularly. Outside the veil of the testimony in the tent of meeting, Aaron shall arrange it from evening to morning before the Lord regularly. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. He shall arrange the lamps on the lampstand of pure gold before the Lord regularly. The lampstand in Zechariah's vision, unlike its tabernacle counterpart, will not depend on the priest to ensure its ongoing operation. The two olive trees in the vision are providing a constant flow of oil to the seven lamps on the lampstand. Having laid out the details of the vision, it's let us consider then the interpretation of the vision. We see Zechariah's inquiry in verse 4. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And in verse 5, the angel responds. I'm going to read this from the CSB if you have your phones. Do you not know what they are, replied the angel who was speaking with me. I said, no, my Lord. So he answered me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. There's a different one again. Not by strength or by might, praise the Lord, but by my spirit, says the Lord of armies. What are you, great mountain, before Zerubbabel, that you would become, uh, you will become a plain, and he will bring out the capstone, accompanied by shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Zerubbabel's hand have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will complete it. Then you will know the Lord of armies have sent me. For who despises the day of small things? These seven eyes of the Lord which scan throughout the whole earth will rejoice when they see the ceremonial stone in Zerubbabel's hand. The angel starts by answering Zechariah's question with a question. Do you not know what these are? It's as if the angel is suggesting that Zechariah should be able to put two and two together. Have you ever been there? Have you had things that you felt you should know but you 
didn't know? And how did that affect your confidence in moving forward in what God was calling you to? The angel moves from question to answer as he declares the word of the Lord. Excuse me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by strength nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of armies. I want us to get how loaded this question is or this statement is. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of armies. God isn't ignoring that they have challenges. God is not minimizing their hardships. He's not downplaying their enemies or the the fact that they have enemies or the strength that they have enemies. This is God acknowledging, I know you don't have the numbers that you used to have. The nation of Israel was massive. But they're returning home after 70 years of exile in waves. So they didn't have the numbers that they used to have. This is God acknowledging that I know you don't have the resources that you used to have. When they built the first temple, Solomon was loaded. And again, now they're coming back, a people of exile after 70 years. They don't have the resources that they used to have. This is God acknowledging I know you're struggling with identity and autonomy. They're, They're trying to figure out again who they are as God's people. And again, not completely free. They're still under the rule of somebody else who's given them permission to go back and rebuild the temple. This is God saying, yeah, I I know you remember what winning feels like, but you haven't had one in so long that you've forgotten how to fight. But this one is on me. I love that. It won't be done by your strength. It won't be done by your might. But by my spirit, says the Lord of armies, I am with you and I am fighting on your behalf. See the significance of the light stand in the angel's response. The temple was the temple, excuse me, was the location where God's God calls his presence to dwell. Where God set up camp, if you will, in the midst of the people. And God's presence with his people, and particularly, is associated with fire. If you remember them leaving uh, uh, Egypt, God was pillar of fire by day. Excuse me, by night, cloud by day. The continual light from the lampstand speaks of the Lord's ongoing presence in the tabernacle. The vision in Zechariah 4 is of a lit lampstand depicting a functional temple in which God is present with his people even though the temple had yet to be rebuilt. So for him to say not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of armies, is a very loaded statement. So then verse 7 becomes God's response to all things. You know what things are, right? The things that we tell ourselves that are reasons of why we can't do what God is calling us to. Again, he's not ignoring that there are things. What are you, O great mountain, he said. See Jesus saying to the man with the withered hand, stretch forth your withered hand. He acknowledges the condition. But the impossible becomes possible because God is present. What is your mountain? What is it that's keeping you from the work that God has called you to? What is it that's keeping you from being the disciple maker that God has called you to be? God says to Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel's mountain. If you only knew how many times I said that this week. It's okay. It's okay. God says to Zerubbabel's mountain, you will become a plain. Obstacles are removed because he is present. What we see next is praise in advance for the completed work of God. Remember, the temple has not been rebuilt yet. 
But it says, and he will bring out the capstone accompanied by shouts of grace, grace to it. Verse 8, then the word of the Lord came to me. Zerubbabel's hands have laid the foundation of this house and his hands will complete it. Are we actively looking for God's grace in our lives that we might give him praise accordingly? Even if it's before the work has been completed. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm in the midst of my things, I have a hard time praising. I have a hard time seeing and acknowledging God's grace and just keeping me where I am. But we got to actively look for evidence of God's grace and give him praise accordingly. And when we fail to do this, we fail to acknowledge that it's not by strength, it's not by our might, but by the Spirit of God. But God's work is a work of the Spirit. Finally, Zechariah turns his attention to the olive trees as he inquires of the angel one last time concerning his vision. Look with me at verse 11. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right and on the left? And the second time I answered and said, what are these two branches of the olive trees which are beside, to the, which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? He said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Concerning the olive trees, again in Leviticus 24 and 2, the word of the Lord says, Command the people of Israel to bring you pure oil from beaten olives from the lamb, that our light may be kept burning regularly. There's only one who can stand and say that they are pure. Only one who is a producer of the oil. In John 16, we find these words, nevertheless, I'll tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. There's only one who was beaten. In Isaiah 53, we read, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. This one branch is spoken of in Zechariah 3 and 8. Hear now, Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are the men who are assigned. Behold, I will bring my servant, the branch, B, capital B. Only who is both Branch, only one, excuse me, who is both branch and capstone. Psalms 118 says, The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, signifying again a completed work. Zechariah 3 and 9 speaks of us of that work. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I have engraved in its description, declares the Lord of hosts, and I remove, I will remove the iniquity. Of this land in a single day. John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is the branch and the producer of the oil. Jesus is the one who takes away the sins of the world. Now, in verse 12 out of our text this morning, the prophet says, What are these two branches from which the oil is being poured out? Commentaries refer to these two branches as, as sons of oil. John 1, 12 says, But all to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. KJV says the sons of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. A couple chapters over in John 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. Telling him that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And what are the sons of oil doing in Zechariah 4 and 14? Scripture tells us that they stand 
by the Lord of the whole earth. The NIV says they serve the Lord of the whole earth. As sons of oil, we are commissioned for service. Just as the lampstand was vital in giving light in the temple, our lives should radiate God's light. Crawford said it earlier, it's our mission statement here at City Light. We exist to shine the light of Christ through the transformed lives of his people. And like the lampstand, which required oil to keep burning, we need the Spirit to empower us to fulfill our call as light bearers. Our lives should be a living testimony, a practical application of Jesus' words found in Matthew 5, scripture that should be very familiar to us. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You have the call. Let your light therefore shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your father in heaven just as oil fuels the lamps the spirit of god empowers and equips us for service in god's kingdom acts 1 and 8 you see again very familiar words but you shall receive power after that which the spirit has come upon you for what for work and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. These were ordinary men. But when the Holy Spirit came upon them at Pentecost, they became powerful witnesses. They were like the olive trees in Zechariah's vision, channeling the Spirit, the power of the Spirit to the world. The transformation of these ordinary men into bold evangelists illustrates for us the tremendous potential that we each have as believers when we walk in the power of the Spirit. In closing, I want to share one final scripture with you. And if you will, read it with me. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Commentaries also point to the two olive trees is Joshua and Zerubbabel, religious leader, a, a, a civic leader. And so sometimes we might look and we might say, well, I don't have work to do. That's for the preachers and the pastors. So I don't really need the spirit and I don't need to witness and I don't need to put my hands to anything that God wants me to put my hands to. Well, this text would say otherwise. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, did he say pastors, preachers, evangelists, teachers? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are called to be ambassadors of Christ, bearing his message and reflecting his character to the world around us, the world that is in desperate need of love and truth. Now, our commission is to serve the Lord of the whole earth by proclaiming his lordship first in our lives. We exist to shine the light of Christ in our city through the transformed lives of his people. And thus, we represent God's kingdom. And this commission calls us to be leaders, yes, some of us. Calls us to be servants, yes, all of us. It calls us to sacrifice. The work is not always easy, but the work is necessary. May we go forth in confidence, knowing that he who began a good work in us is faithful to bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Amen.
Father, we thank you.